together. Um, good morning, everybody. So my name is Nadia, as you heard previously, and this is Benjamin, and we're here to present a joint work of our supervisor, Professor Carsten Binnig. And this work is on natural language interface databases, but also on the concept and kind of more the execution of shared tasks in this research community. So I invite you to find out with us how those relate, and more importantly, what those arachnids have to do with it. Okay. We care about the meaning of the data, not how to access it. Because we all live in a day and age where we have a lot of data. A lot of data is being generated, and it's kind of stored in a more heterogeneous way than ever before. We have the internet with all that it contains. We have still books and, and paper and stuff. We have multimedia, we have everything. But still we want to kind of keep the access open for everybody who's interested. We want everybody to be able to equally access this data, this information that we have. And to do that, we need a way that they can do this without being experts in the field of data retrieval, in the field of information extraction, and in the field of computers in general. That's not too easy. We have several ways of accessing data, um, but they all have their drawbacks and their good points about them. We have structured query languages such as SQL, but to use them, I have to be familiar with the concept of how these things work with joins and nestings and operators and all that kind of stuff. I need to know the particular language that I'm working with, but I also need to know the database scheme that I'm currently working on. So I have to kind of retrain myself every day that I need to see a new database um, on how to use this and how to perform my query. And they can get kind of complex pretty quickly. With nestings and joins, they get long and they're hard to process for a human. We also have visual data exploration, which is amazing, but at some point it also reaches its limits. When we keep on adding further layers, we just can't keep track of what we've done already. But we also have another very, very powerful tool that every one of us knows how to use fairly intuitively in everyday life, and that's speech. That's natural language. And natural language has the advantage of being just beautifully simple. I can phrase this very long SQL query in just a simple sentence. And I can phrase it in 10 other simple sentences as well, because I'm so used to using language in written form, in heard form, in spoken form, in all forms that appoint to me in everyday life, and in several languages, in fact. For English is not my native tongue, but I still can deal with it because I'm, I'm used to learning how to speak. I'm used to learning how to use language. So we can also learn how to use language to access data. On the other hand, of course, language can also get arbitrarily complex. We as humans tend to always add on to the sentence to make it longer, to make it more um, detailed to find what we need. So this is not also not easy. I can't expect any kind of computer, and you all know this because that's what we're here for, um, to understand the sentence easily. I, as a human, can't understand the sentence easily, and I wrote it. So what am I getting at? I'm getting at the, the task of natural language interface databases, the use of natural language to querying a structured data format of some kind. And this task has one core problem that is particularly difficult, that's just translating my natural language, the way I formulated it, into a more structured query language, such as SQL. So one of our core problems in the area of NLIDBs is translating NL to SQL. And that's where the arachnids come in, but I'm going to leave that to Benjamin. Yeah, thanks. So, um, of course, there are a lot of approaches already, and there was particularly one that drove, drove this, this work in this field really further, the spider challenge, which was uh, published at you know, MIT uh, 2018. And um, yeah, the idea is, of course, we all know for, for learning, you need data, a lot of data and getting data, annotated data is costly. Um, it's not practically useful to do so for every database, for every scheme you have at hand, but it would be good to have a general way, to have a general model that can translate uh, and also SQL regardless of the, the underlying database scheme. Um, and that's the idea of, of uh, Spider, where they uh, produced a lot of, of data, uh, magnitude higher than what was previously uh, considered uh, available of annotated data and also SQL uh, pairs that uh, can be used to train such systems. Um, 
they uh, split, uh, make sure that have this data in, in, in different, um, to, to split it up in different uh, difficulties. So, so there are some easy queries, there are some very hard queries which contain probably multiple nestings, joints, whatever. Um, and to further drive this research, they just did not um, publish this data, but they made a shared task out of it. And there is a leaderboard where everyone can submit their uh, solution, their approach, uh, working on this data for that problem. Um, that uh, task is uh, performed out on, on, on multiple uh, data splits and train data, of course, and test data to test locally. But there's also test data that's only available to the authors of uh, the um, of the challenge. And that one is using different databases than, than the, the dev and the train uh, the, and the, the, yeah, the train data. So you really have to show you can perform on new unseen databases as well. Um, of course, they provide everything that's needed for, for the shared task to evaluate and, and, and continue your uh, accuracies. Um, and um, they also split this task up in the one that's just doing the normal translation with placeholders and one that's usually trying to, to predict the correct uh, detailed values. Um, this task had quite an impact. So as I said, it was copied at the NRP um, and was since then uh, cited about over 200 times. The spider original task uh, received up to now over 70 uh, submissions. And there are still new submissions coming up, uh, even though it's already three years old. And uh, in addition, the authors published two uh, follow up challenges that reused some portions of the data, but added new things to have uh, multi turn uh, um, translations, which had to take the context of the first uh, of the last queries into account. And there's even a challenge on a more conversational approach where. In addition to the, to the three queries, there's also uh, those conversational elements and the context has to be inferred from that. Um, but if we now look at those entries, um, so back in June, when we, when we calculate the numbers, there were 62 entries on the leaderboard for the original spider task. Unfortunately, if we now want to use them or if we want to repeat use them, um, we have to probably remove those that are different, uh, which are only in different hyperparameters or minor variations of the same approach. So then we're down to 51 uh, approaches. Unfortunately, also there are a lot of times anonymous uh, publications are, are only names of the authors, but no real publication link. So then we're down to 36 uh, entries. Then when we look where there's code links, so we find out uh, Often it isn't, so we have 22. Of these two, unfortunately, of these 22, unfortunately, two of the links are either invalid or the repository that is empty. empty. So we're down to 20 uh, of those 62 approaches that could, in theory, be uh, reproduced. Um, in theory, as I said, then because if you then really try to do so, then of course you find out they did not pin the dependencies. They uh, did not specify uh, the hyperparameters in all, all times, um, or there are other important things missing. Um, about half of those 20 provide uh, pre trained uh, checkpoints or models, which is quite nice. For the rest, you still have to, to guess the hyperparameters to, to get a um, other new model that performs equally well. Um, so, if we just want to use this, if we maybe don't even care about reproducing, checking if, if other work is, is working fine, but I just want to, to build a new system, new prototype that has in its core or as some part this, this natural language to SQL translation, which I need, but I'm not even completely interested in that. Then I have to invest real hard amount of, 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 of time uh, to, to get this running, to, to get comparable uh, accuracy. Um, so it's, it's not that easy. It's not like, okay, we have this, the challenge, the numbers are high, the accuracy is high, great, the problem is solved. Um, in fact, there are only two of those 62 approaches which provide a real uh, a 
approach that allows it to, to produce it directly either to Jupyter Notebook or um, uh, um, a command line interface where you can really say like, okay, plug in my own data, plug in my own queries and now translate this, and not do just the batch translation of, of the test or training uh, data set. And uh, as we mentioned, there were these follow-up uh, challenges. And if you look at them, it's, it's, it's sim uh, similar. So we have uh, some, some entries, but the ones that are, are really available for, for reuse and, and application afterwards are considered less. So, um, and we find this a pity. We think that it's, it's bad that we have this, those cool submissions, those high performing models, and, and nobody can, can really use them. Um, so we thought, how can we do our contribution to, to make this easier? And our answer is Universal, um, which is a simple Python API that can be plugged in between your system that needs to, to, to run uh, natural language to SQL queries and um, those, those existing approaches. And to implement this, you, you just implement a small wrapper class that uh, provides access to those, to those, to those uh, most important uh, functions, like, like um, choosing a database, connecting to this, perform a real translation, either a single query or multi-joint, and then compared to the, the Spark challenge I mentioned. And um, we also provide two uh, already implemented uh, uh, wrapper classes for two approaches, IRNet and Petit SQL. You can find them as well as the code for, for the API uh, with the link, which we can't. Oh, yeah, you can also look at the paper. Of course, we link it there. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, this encourages other authors to add wrappers for their own um, implementations or if someone uses this and uh, writes this wrapper for, for their own use to, to upload it there. We provide our own leaderboard, so to say, where uh, those, those wrapper implementations are linked and yeah, hope that in addition to those two already available, there will be more coming up and that future submissions to the original spider like leaderboard already contain uh, also this wrapper implementation. Um, to sum, sum this part up, um, we've seen that uh, natural language interfaces for databases allow a good and intuitive access to structured data without the need for, for strong uh, computer science uh, background. Um, and we also saw that a challenge, a challenge task like Spider can really encourage people to, to drive this further, it can really uh, create big impact and create a lot of, of uh, successful models in, in such a field. Unfortunately, um, this doesn't mean that we can simply use those, those existing models already. And we show that, that our uh, API Universal can make this easier since you only have to implement your wrapper class and not the full uh, interface that is needed for translation which makes it considerably uh, faster to, to do so and maybe yeah allows you to quickly do this in addition to, to the things you have to do for the for the uh, publication for the submission of the real task since of course unfortunately it's currently neither forced nor nor awarded if you do so if you provide uh, easy access to, to your model really re reusability for, for that model. So you might have noticed that this is not a very technical talk. Um, we are happy to answer any questions about the API, about the, the translation server that you have, or we invite you to, to check out the repository. Um, but this is not the main reason why we submitted to Desires, and this is not the main reason why we're here. Why we're here is because we'd like to have a discussion with you um, about a couple of aspects that we've already touched upon that relate to these kinds of shared tasks, these kinds of challenges, and how we can actually make good use of them, how we get the most added value out of them. So I've brought a couple of hypotheses um, and some of you might not like me after reading them. So keep in mind that these are not necessarily my opinion, but just um, 
a way of, of phrasing something that we can then talk about. And the first is a bit about um, research directions, because I trust that all of you have by now noticed that the same topic or the same problem can have different names in different research communities. It can be just phrased slightly different. There are variations of the same task, variations of the same problem, and everybody just kind of understands the problem a little bit in their own way. And that's great because that allows us to be creative. That allows us to go at the problem from all sides at once and not just one very fixed direction that once someone has started working on the problem, we are all constricted to because that would be bad. But at the same time, it means that it's very hard to, even between people who are working on similar topics, discuss what we're working on and profit from each other's successes and failures. It means that it's hard to find previous work on the same task just because it was published in a different community and it might be called something a little bit different. Um, so what these challenges and what these chat tasks can do is just kind of align the research just a little bit, just by putting out what the problem could be phrased as um, or how the problem could be evaluated in a more open way than just this one is particularly fit to my approach to my paper. This evaluation was designed for my system, um, but just more generally phrasing a way um, of looking at a problem and then leaving it up to the research community to find solutions to the problem in the first place. So this might put us in a bit of a more parallel way, a way that we can build upon each other's work a little bit easier. The question is, does this bring more benefit than it brings overhead? The next one is a bit about reproducibility, because um, what I've seen a lot over the last couple of years is that many published works, I either have to believe them, or I have to ignore them, because there's no way for me to prove that the results in this paper, that the numbers in this paper are actually obtained by ways of what they described in the paper, that the numbers are correct, but they're just not coincidence or manipulated or anything. I'm not saying that most papers are manipulated, I'm just saying that it's hard to see from an outside perspective on a four page limit um, how these numbers were obtained and what I can read from them, especially if my task is phrased just a little bit differently. And there have been reproducibility efforts, especially at the big conferences, um, to resolve this and to just kind of give people an incentive to favor reproducibility a bit more, but there's still work to be done. Um, but the question that I'm asking here is, is repro reproducibility actually exactly what we want? Is this enough? Is this precisely what we need to get the most benefit from something that somebody else has built? So what problem does re reproducibility solve and what other problems do we, do we need to solve to get the most benefit? And I'm just going to move this bit. Okay, and the last one, um, is not about reproducibility, but about usability. Because as Benjamin mentioned before, just because I can reproduce the number doesn't mean I can actually use the system. Um, in NL2 SQL translations, it's quite obvious because if I can input a JSON formatted file with 500 queries formatted in the way that the spider task published their data, and this can be translated into another JSON format file that can then be evaluated by a given script, that's great for comparing systems, but it's not used to me if I actually want to translate live online this one particular query that I have because it's just not feasible to just keep on writing stuff in JSON files and then pushing them through the system and having four different scripts um, executed. Um, so to actually make productive use of these within research because we see them at the moment either used not at all or in productive use where they're re-implemented, integrated into existing systems and industry or something. But for, for researcher, I can't afford to always re-implement what I've seen, to just kind of dig deep into the code and find out what I need to do to make this work for me. So can we advance our research more efficiently um, if we have increased usability for other researchers, if we have better documentation, but also just have the system in a way that it can productively use it instead of just evaluating it, because there can be a difference. And then the other question is, is that actually achievable? Is that something that researchers in the current climate, in the current way of how we publish at conferences, how we're pressured to do everything quicker than um, everybody else at another university, can we do this? Is this achievable? So uh, thanks for your attention and we'll be happy to hear your opinions on any of that. Omar. Yeah. 
Thank you for thank you for the talk. So I have a couple of perspective of someone who basically, I mean, uh, the real world. So one of the things that sometimes it's good to have is the idea of using an API, right? Which is basically the reason why people build APIs is because we developers were lazy. <laughs> we don't want people to bug us and say, "Hey, how about do this?" Or, you build an API and then you go to your room and that's about it. So I was thinking maybe you want to wrap those two things, the usability and the reproducibility as an API. And you just wrap everything and just give the rest of the planet the API. And the second part of usability is, think of, as you mentioned Python, think of a pip install. And why ML is very popular is because Nobody writes SVMs, nobody writes anything. You just do a pip install, pick some data, plot your curves, voila. So just kind of focus on that aspect. I think it's going to be very useful. So that, those are my two suggestions, APIs, and basically focus on usability. OK, so thank you very much. Um, that's actually what we try to do with University Core, um, just for other people's code. So the idea is that everything that's written in a, in a, like, a common Python machine learning library we can pick a load or JSON load or a PyTorch load or whatever it is um, into that API and we give you a REST API to just kind of query that model. If you just give us a little bit of code that tells us what your model is and how it works, because you know you can do everything with Python. So um, if you're anywhere near an SQL translation, I invite you to check it out. And since we believe that people who focus on usability and reproducibility in these challenges when these tasks um, should be kind of rewarded. We also encourage that people who provide, for example, a wrapper and say, this is an API where you can use my model should be somehow, you know, either rewarded or just pointed out to the community so that this can be a positive aspect. At the same time, minimizing the author's work because the actual API is already there. It's like already implemented. You can install it by a pip. You need the GitHub link, it's not on, on Pipey at the moment. Question from Laura. Yeah, that's what I thought. Laura, can you come in with your question? Of course. Um, so I have like two thoughts. One is a couple of years ago, some of the people from the Bauhaus University did make an effort in the direction of having a shared task where you're not submitting your numbers, you're submitting your code that needs to run on the system of their choice, which means that the software to produce the numbers is there and it's like preserved by the by the shared task organizers. So you want to maybe also like have a discussion with them. The problem was that especially for information retrieval, often we need a lot of data sources. And because the code needs to run on their servers, they didn't have a lot of space. If I come with my two terabyte search index, they wouldn't be able to to accommodate that. So that was like real life challenges. Um, also, I want to push back a little bit on your comment that you can do everything in Python. Um, Python is one of my least favorite languages. It looks very simple, but it's very hard to write code that's actually efficient. Um, and this is kind of like where, why I personally, I don't really use Python for a lot of, like, for a lot of my code. I use stuff that compiles to machine code and is therefore a lot faster. I absolutely agree, and I apologize if that comment was um, could, could be understood differently. What I meant was, it's not easy to rep, to write a wrapper for everything anybody could do in Python because there's just a lot of things that people could do with that language. That's all I was constraining that comment to that our API can't cover everything that's possible in Python. But I do agree with you. Um, although I do like to use Python, I absolutely see those struggles. <laughs> and the other thing that maybe we didn't make as clear because this was not a talk about Spider. Is that they also um, like they keep their tests at private. You don't submit your numbers. You submit something that runs, and they do the evaluation for you. So in that way, it works similar to what you described. It's very interesting. Um, but the thing is that as another researcher, I still don't have any access to how those numbers were produced if the original authors then choose to actively and thoroughly publish. So even if the spider authors have access to that, which I'm not entirely sure how they preserve that, to be honest, um, I don't. And that means I can't work based on that. I just I still have to read the paper and maybe re-implement if I think it's worth it. So there's, there's like another level to that. Um, but I absolutely agree with you on computing resources and the amount of data needed. Ah. Okay, meanwhile, maybe you can uh, read out a question from Jeremy in the chat. 
this one. Okay, so Jeremy wrote uh, on usability. The music information retrieval community tried to create a tool to allow research to virtually chain together different pieces of code written in different languages as long as they were IO APIs. And then there's a link. So I think it's a moderate question, but uh, we, we should, uh, of course, uh, check out this link. Yeah. Then, okay, then I then I take my turn. So thanks, Laura, for pointing to Bauhaus University. So the Tira system is up and running. We are doing this with several um, challenges every year. So we are using virtual machines, but we can talk about details later on since we are all here. Uh, so something that I think you should really do is to send your system to the spider organizers, yeah, so that they advertise on their web page that this system exists and that. I don't know, like what we did in the past, we, we kind of um, also in the paper that we published, we, we said, okay, these people, they share the link, kind of like promoting it a bit. I think this helps already a lot because even if, I mean, then people start to submit code, sometimes it's not really usable code, <laughs> but at least it's always a start. And yeah. Thanks for the advice. So we, in, in our paper, we especially uh, included those two positive examples of, of people who already allowed access to, to their system in a, in a way that's different from, yeah, you can do batch processing once you figure out how a system works. Um, and of course, yeah, we, sh we should definitely contact them right on. So. One more thing to be aware of, maybe. Oh. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. One more thing to be aware of is this uh, OSHARE, Open Source IR as Applicability Challenge that Jimmy Lin organized. They had a nice setup with basically you submit a Docker image and it would run in a standardized system. Sounds that it could be uh, linked. Yeah. But I think uh, all the discussion boils down to the same observation that in the end you need a community of people interested in the same problem and then they start to share. So I think it's really good that you make that sharing easier, but it's still the trick to get the community together and oh, yeah, yeah, put their <laughs> shoulders under your idea, right? Yeah. And of course, it was only well, we we focused on this one single shared task, but yeah, to all of us here, mm -hmm. if, if we, for example, think about setting up a shared task in the future, maybe it would be great if we would add this to the submission guidelines, you have to provide a way to, to reuse the code afterwards, for example. And that's, yeah, something that spider authors did decide not to do, or maybe just didn't think about. But um, yeah, when you're the author of a uh, shared task, you have pretty much the, the possibility to set up the, the rules. Or if you're the reviewer next time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Food for thought.